Now, no one would ever confuse a plant with an animal in the way that animals respond to the environment, but it turns out that plants also respond to their environment as well. So there must be some kind of control systems at work inside of a plant. Let's have a little look at them here. We look at this little seedling growing in the soil, and one thing becomes apparent. You may have done something like this in kindergarten class, where you grew some beans in a jar kept moist by a paper towel. But what always seems to happen is that the green shoots of the plant always seem to grow towards the sunlight, and the roots always seem to go down. So it's green up and roots down. The names we have for these is growing towards the light is called positive phototropism. Photo, of course, being the word for light. Um, but they also have negative gravitropism. In other words, the shoot go repels the force of gravity. Gravity, of course, is pulling a plant down. The shoot grows up against that. So as far as gravity is concerned, it's a negative reaction. Whereas down in the roots, we have the opposite going on. We have a negative phototropism. In other words, the roots don't really like light. They try to grow away from it. Uh, but we have a definite positive gravitropism. Roots definitely grow towards gravity. A number of investigations were done into phototropism, and some were done by Charles Darwin, and his son continued his experiments uh, in, later on in 1880. But here we have another shoot uh, growing, and uh, light comes at it from the side. So let's understand that light's coming at us from the left over here. And what they noticed was, under normal conditions, with no experiment being done, in other words, this is the experimental control, we find that the shoot bends towards the light. And if you take a close look at it under the microscope, you can see that what's happening is over here on the shaded side, uh, the reason why the plant curves over is because these cells are growing a little bit faster or a little bit longer than the cells on the short side. Now, one of the experiments they did was if you chop off the tip. So if you chop the tip off, no bending. So what does that tell us? Well, I guess that tells us that whatever is controlling the bending is located up in the tip, and if you remove the tip, you lose that control. They also found out you could do the same thing by just covering the tip with an opaque cap, something that would block out light. Um, and so it looks like, okay, the tip is responsible, and it looks like you got to have light striking the tip. If you block the light, it won't work. And, and the c conclusion for this one was done with this one, where they used a clear a transparent cap that let the light go through, it bend again. They also found out that it's it's genuinely the tip. If you if you cover the lower section of the the shoot, uh, you, the bending thing still happens. So the control is coming from the tip. Now Boyce and Jensen was another experimenter experimenter who worked on this in 1913. He did something rather clever here. He used a gelatin block, kind of like gelat jello without any flavor. And he discovered that whatever the heck is in this tip up here, it's able to travel through that gelatin block by the process of diffusion. And so he figured out it's a chemical. There's some kind of molecule that's being created in the tip that's drifting uh, by diffusion down into the rest of the plant. He also demonstrated that, you know, if you separate that tip by something which is impermeable, in this case a piece of mica, uh, and, the, and the chemical can't get through, in other words, it gets blocked and can't get through to the other side, uh, then nothing happens. And so we know right now that this control of phototropism, number one, it's a chemical, and this chemical is produced in the tip, and it's a response to sunlight. Well, further experiments were done by this fellow, uh, F.W. Wendt, in 1926, and he was able to identify a hormone called auxin. Here's a chemical picture of it right here. Uh, and a hormone is simply a chemical that is produced in one portion of an organism, travels to another portion, and has an effect. And so he proved once again, looking at the experiment, that the signal is a, is a chemical, and that if you have a permeable um, Mem uh, barrier between the, the, the tip and the rest, it'll work. So here we have a permeable agar, it bends. If it's impermeable, it, it won't bend. He also did some rather interesting things where he, he took a tip right here and exposed it to light so it would build up the chemical shown here as being a red color. And then he placed that tip onto a little block of, uh, of agar and, and allowed that hormone to diffuse so that the, the block of agar becomes filled with the hormone. And then he discovered you can have a lot of fun with this. If you take that hormone-filled uh, uh, block of agar and put it on, on the right-hand side of the tip, then this side here grows faster. It stretches. The cells get longer, and it bends towards the left. Whereas if you do the opposite and put the, uh, the hormone-filled uh, gelatin on the left-hand side, this side of the plant, the left side of the plant grows faster, and it bends towards the right.
So once again, we, we understand that what's happening here is that these cells uh, on one side of the plant are the ones that are elongating, uh, and the hormone shown here in red dots, the auxin, is what's causing these cells to grow a little bit faster, grow a little bit longer than the cells on the inside. The uh, mechanism of gravitropism was sort of discovered later. Uh, here we see a root tip that is bending down towards uh, the ground due to gravity. And, and we found out that what's going on here is that inside of uh, plant cells in the root, we have these uh, calcium deposits called statoliths. And they just basically sink by gravity, as you can see here. They sink to the lower portion of the cell. Uh, gravity does that. And then so what happens again is the cells on the opposite side, these ones here grow a little bit faster, grow a little bit longer, and so the root tends to head down towards gravity. Other control mechanisms exist, and we're going to show you some videos of these in class when we get a chance. And the one we want to show you here is a, a thing called thigmo, thigmotropism. And I guess the most famous example of thigmotropism, or the movement of plants, is this guy. Here, here's a Venus flytrap, and you've probably heard of these things. They have uh, highly modified leaves that spread open, and then if a, if a fly or an insect is dumb enough to step on that, uh, it'll trigger the leaf to close like a sandwich and trap the insect. The plant will then slowly digest uh, the insect's body using various uh, digestive chemicals. And uh, Venus flytraps do this because the soil that they live in is very, very poor. And so what they're basically doing is supplementing their diet with insects. Uh, some Another interesting uh, fellow here is this one. Uh, this guy here is called Mimosa pudica, and he's very interesting. He's called the touch fern. If you touch your finger on one of the leaves here, the leaves will fold up. Uh, they respond to your touch, and they do it quite quickly. You'd be amazed when you see this. Uh, another example of sigmotropism at work is, you've probably seen this in your garden if you grow peas, uh, there are several plants that put out tendrils, and, and a tendril is a modified leaf or a modified petiole, you know, the stem of a leaf, and what they do is they react to touch. When they come in contact with, say, a, a stick, or a stake that you use to hold them up, they will curl themselves around it and the plant gains support. So this is kind of clever because the plant doesn't have to spend a lot of energy making a thick, strong stem. It just grabs a hold of anything near it and uses that to pull itself up. Other plants respond to uh, sunlight here. Here is the response experiment done with what's called a short day plant. So this is a plant that will flower when the days are shorter. Uh, and so this might be a way to gain an advantage over other plants who will flower when the days are longer. If you have a short day and a long night, the plant flowers. If you interrupt that long night with either a low intensity light or a brief flash of light, it won't flower. And so these, this is a way that a plant can respond to its environment and so that it flowers at the appropriate time for its species.